Hello, and welcome to CRPS Contender, my complex regional pain syndrome education channel. Today we are starting the first of our series of scientific articles and journal papers. This series is going to be called Journal Journey. This first paper is on disexecutive syndrome in CRPS, based on a paper called Neuropsychological Deficits Associated with CRPS. This paper was written by a group of researchers from the Department of Neurology at Drexel University in Pennsylvania. It was published in the Journal of International Neuropsychological Society in 2010. The purpose of this paper was to clarify the neuropsychological subtypes of CRPS. To do this, they assessed 137 patients on executive control, naming and lexical retrieval, and declarative memory with several tests, and split the patients into three groups based on the deficits noted on the results. Group 1, they called unimpaired, normal, or average, and this consisted of 35% of the participants. Group 2, they called the dissecutive group, which consisted of 42% of the participants. And group 3, they called the global deficit group, which consisted of 23% of the participants. This meant that overall, significant neuropsychological deficits were present in 65% of CRPS patients. So, let's look at the details. Let's start with a short introduction. CRPS affects between 200,000 and 1.2 million Americans. The female-to-male ratio is 3 to 1, with an average AIDS onset ranging from 37 to 60 years of age. Brain imaging studies of CRPS reveal abnormal brain activity in motor tasks and tactile stimuli, suggesting cortical reorganization. Studies also show abnormally activated dorsolateral and ventral medial prefrontal cortex regions. These regions are important for executive control and memory retrieval and may impact the perceptual learning and blunted emotional decision-making in CRPS patients. Perceptual learning is when repeated exposure enhances our ability to differentiate between two or more otherwise easily confusable stimuli, like two odors that might otherwise be similar, or two musical tones that sound somewhat close to each other, or colors that are close in shade but different shades. It allows us to make long-term recognition of differences. Before we get into the meat of the study, let's talk about the participants. The patients reported significant problems with attention and concentration and multitasking, which is executive and working memory deficits, word finding, which falls under the naming and lexical retrieval deficits, and learning and retaining new information, which falls under the declarative memory deficits. The authors of this paper expected the most common type of neuropsychological impairments in CRPS would be a disexecutive syndrome. 137 outpatients diagnosed with CRPS from a university-affiliated CRPS clinic. All of these patients were evaluated by the same neurologist. Patients were excluded from this group if they were diagnosed with another condition that could account for pain or cognitive dysfunction, such as epilepsy, a traumatic brain injury, cancer, or other similar conditions. The average age of the participants was 44 years, the average years of education was 14 years, and 78% of the participants were female. The first series of tests was on the executive system's function. There were two tests in this category. The first was a digit span test. Patients were told a series of numbers and then were told to repeat those numbers in the exact same order and then say them in reverse order, going backwards. Poor results on the digit backward test is associated with working memory deficits. The second test was a letter fluency test. You had 60 seconds to generate words starting with a specific letter, excluding proper nouns and numbers. The letter fluency tests activate the left dorsolateral prefrontal regions. Impaired results on the letter fluency tests are linked to left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex atrophy in dementia patients. So what were the results from these groups? Group 1, which was the unimpaired group, outperformed group 2 and 3 on both of these tests. However, there was no notable difference between group 2 or group 3 in either test. The second series of tests was about naming and lexical retrieval. Again, two tests were used. The first was the Boston naming test, the 60-item version. You were shown an image and then asked to name it. There was a slight difference between group 1 and group 2, with group 1 outperforming group 2. And then group 1 and group 2 both outperformed group 3. The second test was the semantic animal fluency test, and you were to name as many animals as possible in 60 seconds. The semantic animal fluency test is linked to activation of the left temporal lobe. 
Group 1 produced more examples than Groups 2 and Group 3, but there was no notable difference between Groups 2 and Group 3. The third and final subsection of testing was about memory and learning. There was only one test used in this subsection, but it had two parts. This was the California Verbal Learning Test. The participants were orally presented with a 16-word list, four categories of four words, followed by a second interference 16-word list, with eight of the words from list A and list B being the same. There was then a 20-minute delay, followed by a free recall, where you just try to remember as many words as you can, and then a category Q recall for list A, the first list. This was then followed by a 48-word list, and with each word, participants were asked to identify which words were from the first list as the words were stated. There were two variables to this test. What was your total recall after the 20-minute delay? And what was your ability to correctly identify words from the first list off of the 48-word list? The results of this test are linked to parahippocampal atrophy and the presence of anterograde amnesia. Group 1 had higher free recall than Groups 2 and Group 3. Group 2 had higher recall than Group 3. Groups 1 and Group 2 generated more correct hits and fewer false positives than Group 3. The effects of education and depression were accounted for in this test, but they were not determined to be significant. What about brain imaging? Is there any evidence to back up what they're talking about in this paper? Yes. Evidence suggests there is significant central nervous system involvement in the etiology of CRPS. In a different study, after ketamine coma, fMRI reveals significant changes throughout the frontal, parietal, and temporal neocortical regions of the brain, as well as changes in the anterior cingulate gyrus, hippocampus, caudate nucleus, and cerebellum. Fibromyalgia is thought to be a related pain disorder to CRPS. Fibromyalgia imaging studies reveal altered networks involving the dorsolateral and orbitomedial frontal areas, the anterior cingulate, and the parahippocampal gyrus. There are associations between poor performance in the digit backwards test and a decrease in frontal lobe activity, consistent with executive, naming, and episodic memory deficits as well as changes in the posterior inferior parietal lobule, an area that is cross-modal for cognitive operations and has a lot of left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex connections. Reduced results in the letter fluency tests are linked with left inferior frontal lobe pathology. Now, were there limitations to this study or differences that should be noted? They tried to account for these. They did not find a difference in the results of this disexecutive syndrome that they were looking for on the basis of left versus right limb onset. They did not find a difference on the basis of whether one, two, three, or four limbs were involved. They did not find a difference based on groups representing shorter or longer illness duration. And they did not find a significant difference based on the medication use. They did have some limitations of their study though, however. The average illness duration of the participants was seven years and refractory to treatments. There was a smaller number of neuropsychological tests that were analyzed, and they were limited to working memory. There were tiers in respect to levels of education and levels of depression, which they did not find significant in their study, but probably would have been better if they were more equalized. And there were some patients who they couldn't determine some medication-related factors, but they didn't find that significant either, but there was a, some information left out on some patients. But in an overall summary, what did they take away from their research? They ended up with three groups, as we referenced at the beginning. Group 1, that they called unimpaired. 35% of the participants were in the statistically average range. Personally, I think it's worth noting that if you had people who were on the higher end of the range to begin with that did have deficits, they might still test in the average range, even if they personally don't feel like they are what they used to be working with before. This group may be less affected by the central nervous system involvement or have differential network projections. Group 2 which had disexecutive deficits, consisted 42% of the participants, were low average performance primarily for executive tests. Group 2 and Group 3 displayed equal executive impairment, measurably reduced compared to Group 1, suggesting a compromised ability to engage in higher order mental manipulation. Group 3, the global deficit group, consisted of 23% of the participants, were low average to borderline performance on all tests.
This group had greater impairments found in naming and memory, and the profile suggests executive dysfunction based on retrieval rather than amnesic problems based on encoding, meaning the information is still getting into your brain, you're just having a hard time getting to it. Group 2 and Group 3's neurocognitive networks may be the same, differing in only the extent of brain involvement, or Group 3 may include temporal lobe deficits in addition to frontal lobe involvement. They were not able to tell from the results of this study. And finally, in conclusion, despite the limitations and data reported here, this study is consistent with recent MRI and VBM imaging studies in CRPS suggesting problems involving a wide network of cortical and subcortical areas, providing additional evidence from a central nervous system involvement in CRPS. As predicted by the authors, this research suggests a disexecutive syndrome that tends to dominate the clinical profile of CRPS. The differences in the disexecutive group 2 and global group 3 appear to relate to the severity of executive frontally mediated cognitive deficits. Again, significant neuropsychological deficits were present in 65% of CRPS patients. What does this mean in a more practical, day-to-day -day sense? Executive functions are intentional activities that require initiation, organization, and structure. There's a couple major subgroups of this relating to planning, which is identifying and organizing the necessary steps to achieve a goal. If you're having issues with this, this is usually related to damage to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The next one is cognitive flexibility. This is your ability to adjust your behavior appropriately in response to what's going on in your environment. Damage to the VMF is associated with emotional dysfunction and behavioral incompetencies. The next is initiation and self-generation. This is the level of latency in responding and initiating pre-morbid activities. Can you get up and go? And can you get what needs to be done first before you need to do the task you actually have to do? Response inhibition is the next subsection. This is your ability to inhibit inappropriate behavioral responses and impulsivity. And then serial ordering and sequencing. This is the ability to take the proper steps in the proper order. If you are having issues with executive dysfunction, all of those areas can be challenging, difficult, or impaired in some way. This can have major impacts on everyday living. Everyday functions place tremendous demands on the executive system in order for an individual to conduct themselves in an efficient and appropriate manner. Complex situations such as shopping or preparing a meal, things that require organization and the structuring of goals, require many different cognitive resources which are impaired in CRPS. The ability to compensate for these deficits may be largely related to two things, the external demands placed on an individual and the cerebral reserve available, which is just basically a fancy way of saying the intelligence of the person affected. People with executive deficits who encounter real life problems may be incapable of responding appropriately or fail to select the most advantageous choice out of the response options available to them because their brain structures are not working properly. There are two clear patterns of failure for people who have a disexecutive syndrome, rule breaking and failure to achieve tasks. There are two main sources of failure for these two patterns, memory failures and problems with initiation. We're running rapidly out of time here, so I will link the sources in the bottom. Thank you so much to my patrons, Chase and Emily Malcontent. If you would like to help me be able to make more of these while not having to worry about my housing, my Patreon is listed below. My next video has already been selected and the research has been done. The notes have been written. I just have to put it together. So that should definitely be out by the end of the month. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something today. See you next time.